Now, as we've talked about in class, um, the addition and subtraction components for three dimensions and uh, for vectors in particular, or in general, as we've been talking about, um, kind of follow all the rules that we would expect or want to have happen. Um, we're about to encounter something that's a little bit different. Uh, what we're about to encounter is we're about to encounter quote-unquote multiplication, and what we're going to find is there's two different ways of multiplying vectors. The first one is this section, and this is 11.3, and it's called the dot product. So to start with, our definition of the dot product says that if we have two vectors, a1, a2, a3, and then b1, b2, b3, in v3, so v3 is vector space, three dimensions, um, then our dot product is defined to be the sum of the component multiplications of those vector terms. So a1 ends up being multiplied, whoops, sorry, ends up being multiplied by b1, you see that, and then a2 by b2, right? and then A3 by B3. And then we add those components together. Now, an interesting thing to realize is that this actually ends up giving me a scalar. I get a number out of this. Now, every other operation that I've done with vectors so far, if I started with a vector, I ended with a vector. In this case, I don't. I end up with a scalar when I'm done. And likewise, we could sort of two-dimensionalize this um, idea of a dot product, and you see that one written there as well, that a, you get A1 times B1 and a2 times b2, and then the sum of those. So again, you get a scalar or a number out of that. Now, it's important to realize that these products, or these this product, dot product, actually has quite a few of the same theorems that we've seen before. So it doesn't matter the order, it's commutative. So that first property is the commutativity property. Um, the second one, of course, is associativity. It's, it's got the same associative property. Um, we've got some scalar reassociations with the multiplication as well. Um, if we multiply a zero vector times any vector, we get zero. And if we multiply or we, we do the dot product of a scalar with itself, it's actually the same as the magnitude squared. So it's like the like the, it would be giving us the magnitude without the square root part of the magnitude. All right, so we're going to practice. We're going to do one of these. We have a vector a given and a vector b given, and we're going to find the dot product. So we're just going to multiply these component-wise. This is 2 times 0 plus negative 1 times 2, plus 3 times negative 4, which gives me 0, minus 2, minus 12, or negative 14. So the dot product for um, this particular set of vectors, a and b, is negative 14. <clears throat> We're going to also define the dot product in a way that involves magnitude. So if we take a angle theta and we talk about the angle between our two vectors, a and b, then the dot product of a times, or a dot b, is actually the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of theta. So using this variation of our theorem, um, of our definition for dot product, we can actually find the angle between two vectors. So as you can see, it says to compute the angle between the vectors. And we're given two vectors, a and b. So this angled for or this formula from the um, previous slide that we're wanting to do is we're wanting to compare a dot b, the magnitude of a, times the magnitude of b, and the cosine of theta. And if we're actually able to find theta, it means we're able to actually find values for all of these other ones first and then solve for theta. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to come down here. Um, actually, what I'll do is I'm going to move this one down, and we're going to find all these. Um, individual things that we've uh, identified here, except for, of course, the cosine of theta part. And we're going to evaluate our um, equation with those pieces plugged in. So we're going to start with a dot b. We're going to practice that one again. So component-wise, multiplications, this is 1 times 2 plus 3 times, it's actually 0 because there is no j component on the second vector b, plus negative 2 times negative 3. So I end up getting 2 plus 6, or 8. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is we'll do the magnitude. So, oh, so in my formula down here, this is 8 on the left. We'll do the magnitude of a next. We're just going to move kind of across the, the equation. So the magnitude of a should be the square root of each of the components squared. So this would be 1 squared is 1, 3 squared is 9, and then 2 squared is 4. So we get the square root of 14. And then we'll do the magnitude of b. So down here, we've actually got square root of 14 in here now. All right, so the magnitude of b is each of the components. There's actually only two components in this one. So this is 4 
and 9, and we square each of these components right up here. So that gives me the square root of 13. All right, so we're going to take this equation now, and we're going to try and solve it for theta. So first of all, we'll divide by the square root of 14 and the square root of 13, and then we'll take the inverse cosine. So this theta ends up being the cosine inverse of 8 over the square root of 14 times the square root of 13. And you could actually just use your calculator to evaluate that. If you want to simplify the denominator first just to make it easier on yourself, you of course could do that just by multiplying those. Um, that's actually the number 182 underneath that square root in the denominator if you want to combine them. Uh, but if you do this and then you do your inverse cosine and, in, and you're doing it in radians as you should be, you're going to find out that this is 1.1911 radians. And we'll go with four decimal places because that's the pattern your book is using. So that ends up being the angle measure between vectors A and vectors B. All right, now there is a relationship that happens in in vectors that's very similar to something that happened back in uh, algebra with lines. So we have two vectors, A and B, and we've got this new word, it's called orthogonal. Something's orthogonal if something happens. Um, orthogonal means perpendicular. It's just another word for perpendicular. So two vectors are perpendicular, right, like this to one another. If and only if the dot product is zero. Now if you take a look at the equation, that makes sense. Because if the dot product is zero, then this, uh, this formula right here means that this angle is 90 degrees. And 90 degrees, or pi over 2, the cosine of that value is actually zero. So it wipes everything out over here because um, we actually get a zero for that value. So this all goes away. So that's why we're actually having um, the ability to say what we're saying on this particular problem. So that's sort of a, a mini, you know, wave your hands kind of proof for this argument. Um, so we're going to decide if a set of vectors here is actually orthogonal. So in order to decide that, we can actually just take a look at the dot product. And this is actually just a two, two by two vector, right? We've got two vector, two component vectors here. And so um, we can take a look and we can take two times two plus and then negative one times four. And sure enough, we add those together, we get zero. So they are, are orthogonal, yes. They are orthogonal. Okay. And of course, if it hadn't been zero, the answer would be no, that they're not orthogonal. All right, so we're going to take this idea of the vectors being orthogonal and apply this in a different context. So this example actually asks us to find a three-dimensional vector that is perpendicular to the given vector. That's part A. And then part B, it's got another direction. So we'll just do the part A first, and then we'll talk about part B's direction next. So we want it to be perpendicular. Now, if you take a look here, you'll notice there's no J component here, right? So this is like 2, 0, negative 3. So what we want to do is we want to multiply this by another vector, you know, the dot product, so that, you know, in fact, it doesn't really matter what we put in the middle term because it's going to get multiplied by 0. But the first term and the last term have to cancel. So the simplest thing to do is to simply change them to have a negative 3 here and a positive 2 here. And one of them needs to actually have a different sign. So uh, maybe we'll use a positive 3 instead. So a positive 3 and then a 2. So the reason I say that is because then when I take, let's say this is A and this is B, and I do the dot product, then I end up with 2 times 3. The middle term is 0 times 0 or whatever you'd like. You can really put anything right there. And then you have plus negative 3 times 2. So what we want is we want these, in this particular case anyway, to end up being 0 when they're added together. So if they're identically the same, but opposite signs, then that will happen. So this, in fact, it does equal 0. So we would have one, it says find a three-dimensional vector, right? So a three-dimensional vector that would work would be 3, 0, 2. And again, you could put anything where the 0 is and, and actually change this. So you could do 3, negative 5, 2, and, and it would be fine as well. This is part A. Part B's directions we haven't actually read yet. Part B says to find a vector of the form a2, negative 3 that's perpendicular to the given vector. So we are going to use that vector to figure out what we would need to do. Um, and again, you can see um, that the, the vectors that we create from part A really could look like anything when we take a look at this one. So we're going to take our vector a, I called it a anyway, which is 2, 0, negative 3. And they're giving us a vector basically called B. And the vector B actually has a letter A in it. So this is probably 
bad notation. I don't mean it to be the same A. Um, just for the sake of argument, let's change this to an X up here so that we don't have a duplicate letter. Um, so on your homework, you can be a little bit more careful about what you call your vectors, because I, I was obviously not being very careful. So we'll do X2 and negative 3. So we're going to do the dot product of A dot B. So this would end up being 2X plus it's 0 in the middle, of course, and then negative 3 times negative 2 would be 6. But we want the dot product to be 0, so if we solve this equation, 2x equals negative 6, so x needs to actually be negative 3. So what we end up finding is that the vector that has this form, that is, that answers the question we were asked, would have the form negative 3, 2, negative 3. And that would be another orthogonal vector to the one that I started with. And it has to make sense that there's infinitely many orthogonal vectors, because you have to remember we're working in two dimensions. So perpendicular is a, is a unique idea in, in two dimensions, but in three dimensions, the idea of it being perpendicular wouldn't be. And you can just imagine the corner of a room. So in the corner of a room, you have three vectors meeting there, and they're all orthogonal to one another, at least if the room's square, you know, a square corner like, like most are. They're all orthogonal to each other. They're all arriving at perpendicular angles. So there's three already just like that that would actually work in this idea, too. All right, I'm going to present a couple of um, theorems here that you're going to use in your homework, and you're going to do a little bit of proofing with them. Um, they aren't anything terribly difficult, the proofs themselves, um, but you'll be able to take a look at those when you get to your homework. The first one is Theorem 3.3. It's called the Cauchy-Schwartz Inequality, and that is Cauchy, not Cauchy. Cauchy-Schwartz Inequality. And it says for any vectors a and b, the dot product of a dot b, and then the absolute value of that, is less than or equal the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b. And then theorem 3.4 is a similar kind of description, but it, is, it isn't the same, of course. It's called the triangle inequality, and the triangle inequality says for any vectors a and b, the magnitude of a plus b is less than or equal to the magnitude of a plus the magnitude of b. And this one has a really nice imagery I'll, I'll draw for you here um, since we're at this point. And basically the idea is that if I have a vector a and a vector b, um, I'll extend b up here just for the argument's sake for a minute here. All right, so let's say this is vector a down here and this is vector b. Then we've talked in class about taking a and b and putting together, and what it actually means is that you would sort of finish out this triangle, something like this. So I know that's not terribly straight, but I wanted to change the color so you could see the difference. Um, so, and the reason is because if we took the vector a and um, hang on, I think I drew that wrong just a second. Yes, I did draw that wrong. Let me fix the picture. Let me start over, okay? All right, let's try again. So let's take the vector a, and we'll just draw a vector a. Whoops. Here, here's vector a. We want to put them end to end. That's what I didn't draw correctly. So there's vector a, and then vector b is on the end of that. All right, so here's vector b. There we go. Then the sum of vectors a plus b is actually going to be this line that connects the ends to each other. So this is a plus b visually. Uh, and we drew that once before. So we've got this line A plus B across here. So this is actually a triangle. That's, that's why it says the triangle inequality. And what it's saying is that uh, the idea is, and you've heard this phrase before, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So if you're hoping to go from this corner to this corner and you have the ability to do so, a straight line through where the purple is would be the fastest way to do that. It would not be shorter to go from A across here on the bottom and then going up on line B. That, that wouldn't make any sense in terms of distance covered. Now, if, if you're looking at something with roads or something like that, that's another issue. But in terms of actual distances here, that's what this is. So this right here says this is the magnitude or the length of AB. It has to be less than or equal to the length of A plus the length of B. And you might be looking at it and saying, um, no, it doesn't have to be less than or equal. It has to be less than. It has to be less than. And the answer is not, not true. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be less than. If our vector a looked like this and our vector b was parallel to it and looked like this, then vector a, b would actually be, a plus b rather, would, would actually be the same thing. So that's the place when it would actually be equal to each other. So you're going to look at some examples of those pieces um, in your homework. The last concept in this section is called components and projections. I'm going to draw you a couple pictures to go with these as well so you have some ideas. But let's just write the equations down first. 
Uh, the components of A along B is defined to be the dot product divided by the, the magnitude of B. And notice this gives you a scalar when you're done, right? Because this is a number, A dot B on top, and it ends up being a scalar or a number at magnitude of B on bottom. Projection of A is actually that same A dot B on top. The denominator is actually the magnitude squared. And then times a vector B, so this actually ends up being a vector. So the projection of a, of a vector onto a vector is a vector. The component of a vector along a vector is actually a scalar. That was the one we did before. So let me draw some pictures to show you what's going on with these, what they're, what they're actually describing. So let's imagine that this is vector A, and this one down here is vector B. Okay. So here's A, here's B. What the component of A along B is, is it's taking an image, basically, and imagine that the sun is sort of like on top of this, and the image is the shadow that's perpendicular straight down. So the component of A along B is this length right here. Obviously, it's not the same length as the length of A, right? Definitely not. It's going to be shorter, so it's going to be a smaller uh, magnitude than the magnitude itself of A. But it's like you're projecting it down. You're sort of, you're doing the component, how far across I go across B, perpendicular to the to the value a down and again a shadow is a good description of this so if we had you know this this vector right here hanging out up here sort of like a um you know like well you know what a good description actually would be is like a ladder leaning along the side of a of a of a house well if the ladder is leaning along the side of the house so here's my house over here then the projection piece that we're talking about right here is this is this one right here so um this would be the component of a, B, of A along B. So this would be sort of like, here's, here's my ladder, right? This would be the ground space that, that later, the ladder is sort of taking up as it leans. All right, so the other one is the projection. And so it's very similar, very, very similar. We actually end up with the exact same image um, initially drawn. So I'll draw my same image of A and B. So imagine that those are exactly the same length. So here's A, here's B. Um, what the projection is, is it's actually, again, done, a, done horizontally, down straight to here. But what we do is instead of actually talking about the length of this vector, it's actually this vector. So that's actually the vector that's created when you sort of have the sun shining down on it. It's the projection along the wall or along the sidewalk if we think about our ladder against our house. All right, so we're going to find these two particular quantities of component of A along B and the projection of A onto B with the vectors A and B listed on this particular problem. So you'll notice that both of those equations have A dot B in it. So let me actually write down those equations down here as our goal of what we're trying to find. We want the component of A along B, and that's A dot B over the magnitude of B. So we're going to have to find all three or both of those components. And then we want the projection of B, of A, excuse me, onto B, which is again A dot B, again also the magnitude of B, but then we're going to multiply it times vector B. So I actually just need to find two, com two different values. First I'll find A dot B. So this is component-wise multiplication, so 2 times 1 plus negative 1 times 2 plus 3 times 2. And if we simplify that, we're going to get 2 minus 2 plus 6, or a grand total of 6. And then I need the magnitude of b. The length of b is what we're looking at. So this is the square root of 1 plus 4 plus 4, which actually ends up being the square root of 9 or 3. So that's a nice whole number. We've gotten to come about upon that one. All right, so over here, um, for the component of a along b, we get 6 over 3, or a, a scalar of 2. And then the projection, this is a length of 2. Um, and then the projection of A onto B ends up being that same, oh, that's B squared, I'm sorry, I left that squaring off. Ends up being that same 6, but now it's over 3 squared. And not only that, but it needs to be multiplied by the vector B, which was 1, 2, and 2. So to start with, this is 6 over 9, which reduces to 2 over 3. And then we're going to multiply it by the vector 1, 2, 2. Oops. So we end up getting 2 thirds, 4 thirds, and 4 thirds as that vector.